If I'm still stuck in my head about it shouldn't be this way, then I'm in fantasy. I'm in my mind. I'm wishing it was differently than the way that it actually is. If I acknowledge reality for what it is, if I just, okay, now it's like this, then I am, I'm in reality, I've acknowledged it for what it is, and then I'm in a working plane. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can affect reality, I can make changes to it. If that reality isn't working for me, but I see it for what it is, then I have a starting point, a place to move forward from. And welcome to Curious Ones podcast by Andara. I'm Yael Ginsberg, the host of the podcast, a yoga and meditation teacher and philosophy lover. Each week you will hear eye-opening interviews with the different teachers of the Andara Yoga Institute located in beautiful Baja, Mexico, along with other teachers that pass through here. This life-changing knowledge shared through authentic, heartfelt communication will help you live a happier, more fulfilled, and connected life. Let's dive in. I am so excited to have my guest today, Sarah Swati Young. She is an experienced yoga teacher and surfer, an inspired devotional musician and sound healer, studying mantra and music with her mother, Mercy Ananda, who was on the podcast, and I definitely recommend anybody to go listen to that episode as well, because she's incredible. Um, Sarah Swati is a devoted mother and a living, breathing, embodied expression of joy. So I'm so happy to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. Um, I would love for us to start by hearing a little bit about your story and how you got to be a yoga teacher teaching here at Yandara and living in Mexico. Yeah, well... It was nothing planned. It all happened um, gradually and without really any foresight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, my family and I came here on a vacation to just camp on the beach to surf. My sister and I mm, drove down with our parents, Mercy and Shivadas, and yeah, we spent a lot of time at the beach here, um, close to Yandara's location now. And um, <clears throat> our parents are devotional musicians, so they kind of got tied in with the school and started doing the evening program. Mm -hmm. The sad song playing um, kirtan and mantra and sharing what they do with the students here. So just gradually, my sister and I became more and more involved i started working in the garden originally mm -hmm. um, where the pool is now there used to be a big veggie garden mm, <clears throat> and amazing. yeah there was this really incredible woman here at the time and she taught me a lot about the garden and mm, yeah um eventually craig the owner of yandara offered my sister and i to take the teacher training so as sort of an exchange, I had been doing work more as like a volunteer offering. And so he gave me a place in a training and I went through the course and um, pretty shortly after, I'd say probably like the following day after my graduation, I, um, I thought to myself with whom could I continue this practice? Like I wanted to focus on something more specific. Um, I was really drawn to mantra and kirtan. So being around that as a child, um, I had always been exposed to it, but I hadn't practiced it myself. And I thought, well, my mom's here and she's an amazing being and a great teacher. So I asked her if she would basically 
like mentor me. Really? And she was completely like overwhelmed with joy to to share her passion with me. So we started playing music together. She taught me the harmonium. And um, <clears throat> that kind of has continued till now. And we do a lot of music together. So I, I took the training, started studying more music, and basically within a month or two started assistant teaching. Yeah, I was in classes with Christopher mostly and just sitting in on classes, watching and learning and gradually um, started taking on more and more teaching roles. So it was kind of like an apprenticeship Mm -hmm. And I didn't plan for any of it. I was very nervous before I ever um, even started trying to teach yoga. Like I was really shy as a kid, never really saw myself as being in a teaching role or feeling comfortable speaking in front of groups of people. Um, But I stuck with it (laughs) and it did get easier. Um, and became more and more natural after years of doing it. Yeah. And so the the mantra part as well, I would sit in with the band in the evening and play songs occasionally and um, used to get really like butterflies and all those sensations in my body. But I kept doing it. And then eventually it all kind of just became more natural, more relaxed, and really enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of been my journey, and now it's been phew, like 13 years working at Yandara mm-hmm. and teaching, and I've led trainings, and um, it wasn't anything I sought out necessarily. It was like it was handed to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Like Craig offered, and we're like, okay, cool. Yeah. And then one thing just led to a next. It was very organic. Mm-hmm. I feel like the most aligned things that come to us usually come as an offering and mm-hmm. not as something that we kind of like seek out and force them, you know? Right. What has been the most meaningful part of? becoming a yoga teacher for you? Seeing how it affects others, I would say. Mm -hmm. Like seeing the transformation that happens in people that come and participate in our courses, the way they are supported um, within a group setting like feeling the community and all of that together. Mm, Yeah, that's so true. It's incredible. Even if you don't mean to be a yoga teacher, a yoga teacher training, especially an immersive one in a place where you're kind of staying there and living there for a month or a few weeks is transformational to anybody who, who is in it. It's, it's incredible. I definitely recommend to people who are, looking to become a yoga teacher to find the time to go and do an immersive experience because there's also um, programs that are like every weekend or a few days a week while you're doing your other things which I also see the benefit in that because then you get to actually apply what you're learning into your day-to-day life but the transformational value of being immersed in the studies is just unparalleled in in my opinion. Yeah, it's <clears throat> it's a special thing to be able to do to take the time. It's kind of like a gift you could give yourself to mm-hmm. really just explore more deeply, I think. Yeah, definitely. So I would love to talk about your name because it's very special and it's from the Hindu um, tradition. So would you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. So I mentioned my mother is a kirtan musician and she named me after the goddess Saraswati. Saraswati is kind of a a Hindu deity that 
represents creativity, um, dance, literature. She holds a book in one hand and she plays an instrument. So she's got this sort of um, focus on knowledge and, and then expressing creatively. Mm -hmm. I find that our names are very relevant to actually who we become in the world. So yeah. how do you feel that you relate to that um, character? Well, it's interesting because as a child, it was a difficult name to have. No one in my culture was familiar with the name Sarasvati. They had a hard time pronouncing it. And I would just say, oh, just call me Sarah, call me Sarah. And now as an adult, I've come come into this role as like a, a yoga teacher where that name is sort of part of a tradition that I'm very much involved with. And it's very fitting and um, I really love it. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, what I've chosen to focus on also is very much aligned with what Sarasvati represents. So it's interesting, <laughs> people have even mentioned you were like, <laughs> you know, an embodiment of Sarasvati. And mm. I don't, I wouldn't say that about myself, but <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting concept to me. Mm. And it reminds me just of the vibrational sort of uh, quality of the Sanskrit language. And that perhaps just being called Sarasvati my whole life has sort of instilled a specific vibration that she connects with perhaps mm -hmm. i don't know maybe <laughs> yeah i mean that makes sense i always think about it as in what comes first the name giving the vibration to the human and kind of growing mm -hmm. into that or is it the vibration of the human that attracted the name i love that way of thinking about it yeah that's cool. Because like when my sister is about to have a baby now and she's naming or th they're naming the the baby. And it's it's so interesting to think like, where does the name come from? Does it come from your uh, like kind of your gut and your feeling what you want the baby to be? Maybe you can speak about your son and yeah. the way that you named him. Yeah, it's a process, or it was for me. I spent months li reading names, looking mm -hmm. at lists and lists of names, and had several potential options, and then found the name that we ended up using. And, which um, is? Which is Naleo. Mm -hmm. Naleo. Beautiful. Naleo, um, as soon as I read it and learned more about what it represented. I just, it was immediately, yes, that's his name. What does it represent? Um, Naleo is a Hawaiian name and it means voice of the people. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Who just knows? Felt, felt really powerful. And, yeah. yeah. Maybe one day he'll become a, a voice of the people. Yeah. His middle name is Oceano, which is mm. Spanish for ocean. Yeah. And so I'm very much connected to the ocean and spending a lot of time there and his father is as well. And so, yeah, kind of tying that in, it was like this feeling of like a voice of the ocean people. I almost imagine him mm -hmm. as like an ocean preservationist or someone involved in just taking care of our earth. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> kind of reminds me of the movie Moana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie. It's a good one. He likes it too. Yeah. <laughs> um, what we're talking about reminds me a lot of about the power of words mm -hmm. and the vibrational um, strength of Sanskrit words. Maybe you can speak about that as well. I think mm -hmm. it's interesting. Um, something that I learned here at the training. And then just in, just in general, the power of words that they have in our experience and in our relationship to others and to ourselves. Yeah. 
think of sound as a vibrational expression and words create different sounds and different feelings. And when we're unaware of our, of our choices, when we're unaware of our self-expression, we can perhaps choose words that have a lower frequency or vibration that might cause harm to ourselves, to others. And when we understand the power of words, when we understand the power of the feeling that they create, that they kind of expand outward and affect everything around us, including ourselves, then I think we can have a little more, take a little more responsibility for the words we choose and speak from a place of understanding or even just a place of feeling where we're speaking from, like knowing what motivates us. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, and in any language. <laughs> yeah. So in mantra and kirtan, we're using words that have specific frequencies. Everything is vibrating, everything makes a sound, and they resonate at different sort of frequencies or speeds out into the space around us. And we can align our own personal energy with those frequencies. So using really intentional um, vibrations, choosing words that align our energy body to like a loving state or an open state or whatever the intention is. Mm -hmm. yeah. I completely agree because I think that sometimes I, when I want to express myself in a way that really resonates with what I'm trying to convey, I feel like I need to speak slower mm -hmm. in order to make sure that the words are really coming from a place of this is what I want to express in the world and not from, I, I don't know, I kind of like, I feel it in my body. Like, is it coming from my belly and my truth or is it coming from the mind? And I don't even know where that comes from. Maybe it's just like kind of perception of what I think I should be saying instead of what I actually mean. Yeah. Yeah. What, how do you find has been an effective way for you to communicate? What comes to mind as you're speaking is like the throat chakra, the energy in the throat, which that area is ruled by Sarasvati, just mm. so happens to be, um, is all about listening. So we might think, we just need to say what we feel and get it out. But the first step to that, I, I really feel in order to express ourselves genuinely and truly, we have to listen first and not listening necessarily outwardly, but listen in. Yeah. Like you said, like slow down. Yeah. Give yourself the opportunity to actually feel where where these thoughts are coming from, does it need to be said, mm -hmm. right? finding the way to say it that will be in a line with, with what you're actually experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. So slowing down is yeah. the main key, I would say. Definitely. And that also <laughs> reminds me of kind of the feeling of feeling safe to communicate and be honest and vulnerable and real and actually say what you mean and what you want and what you need yeah. um how do you navigate that well it takes practice <clears throat> um there are some tools that have been helpful for me like i said i was super shy as a kid I had a really hard time just expressing myself in general and especially if I had 
uncomfortable feelings or feelings that I thought were not good, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, if I was unhappy with the situation, you know, it's easier when things are kind of like feeling all right, but when we have a conflict or something inside that just doesn't feel like it's working for us, then that's when it's helpful to have have tools, have like some techniques or some options. So I never really was aware or knew of any of these tools until I came to Yandara. Mm-hmm. And when I did my training, when I was 18 years old, Mm -hmm. we did a practice called satcha, which is truthfulness, um, gathering in community and just getting familiar with saying how you feel, saying how it is in that moment without um, any need to really filter necessarily. And so the tools that have allowed me to speak more freely and and with integrity of how I was actually feeling um, are like using I statements, just expressing things from my perspective rather than you blaming others for how I feel yeah. and making it about what they did to me, but just simply stating how I feel in that moment. Mm-hmm. And also, Noticing where I feel it in my body. So getting below the neck. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when we're experiencing something that's difficult, the the mind gets super busy and likes to run off with the story. And so uh, if I can notice like a sensation in my body, maybe a contraction or a pulsation or just anywhere like a location and a feeling there really helps me to allow that emotion to be and share how my experience is with others what do you mean for example if i'm having a like a a difficult moment with someone, say it's my partner, and they show up late and I'm disappointed rather than, you know, the the normal sort of communication of like, ah, oh, you're such an asshole. Why did you show up late again? Like, I'm so sick of this. Rather than making it about what they did to you, mm-hmm. um, I would work towards framing it more as like, oh, I feel, I feel a little disappointed. There's, there's actually like this deep sinking feeling down into my belly and it makes me kind of sad. Mm. So it's all about me. Yeah. Um, And then they know how I feel. Yeah. But I didn't necessarily blame them for anything. I just gave them little insight into what their actions caused for me and my body. And then when I'm with that feeling, rather than playing out the story of being a victim and they're the one causing this experience in my body, um, it it allows it to sort of transform. So I find that it creates space for that emotion to move if mm-hmm. I'm aware of it. If I'm unaware of it, who knows? Probably gets stuck somewhere and comes up again later. Mm-hmm. Someone once described, described emotion to me as energy in motion. Yeah. And if we let it move, if we just think of it or consider it as energy in motion and like feel it and let it Mm -mm. work its way out, then it just transforms itself. Definitely. Instead of like fighting it and resisting it, then letting it flow. I love what you said now, because I think the way that you reframed um, an experience or I guess like even a conflict makes it in terms of letting the other person know how you feel, it 
kind of allows them to think like, do I want to make this person that I care about feel this way again? Right. And then I guess it can be also a good kind of like gauge of, is that a person you want in your life? Because if they know that what they're doing is making you feel in this way and they continue doing it, then I guess, would you say that that could be a strong indicator as well? Yeah, to learn where boundaries might be helpful or necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then there's also something that I'm thinking about recently about focusing on the good and instead of kind of talking about what's going wrong, let's say we're talking about a relationship, Mm -hmm. there is use in talking about how we want things to be, right? And making requests and, and expressing how we experience different things. And then I think there's also a lot of use in focusing on the good. And then when we focus on the good, it expands and becomes more. Hey, I'm quickly interrupting the episode to extend an invitation. If you are interested in deepening into any of the subjects we talk about on the podcast, we offer many different experiences on our beautiful grounds here in Baja, Mexico. From nine-day modules such as sound healing and yoga nidra, to breath and meditation, as well as two or 300-hour yoga teacher trainings, and many different shorter retreats. Check out our website, yandara.com, to see all the information about the different experiences. Let's get back to the episode. I find the practice of gratitude a way to just remember all that I have to be thankful for and shift my attention, especially if I'm sort of stuck in seeing all the things that maybe could use a little more work or attention, like to just also see the things that are working really well as they are and reminds me of a of a quote from um, Judith Lassiter she said yes progress is like this sort of idea of evolution is is wonderful our human nature is to want to grow and evolve and change but right now right where we are has a beautiful wholeness to it it's like sometimes we only see all the things we need to fix but if we can also see all the things that are perfect just as they are it's like Mm -hmm. helps find the balance Mm -hmm. what do you mean by that Mm. When I am focused on all the things that I want to change or that aren't exactly the way I want them to be right now, I'm in a future mindset. And when I'm grateful for this moment, I'm very present and relaxed and at ease in my body. And I think there's... a necessity to work towards things. There's there's a growth that comes from having goals and knowing what you want to work towards, but there's also like a really nice, spacious, relaxed feeling of enjoying where you are right now. Like, experiencing the process of things as they unfold rather than being so attached to the outcome Mm -hmm. focusing only on how you want it to be versus seeing how it is in the moment yeah that's true i love that you took it to this direction because it's not only in relationships right it's it can be just in general about our life right because it's so easy for us to only look at what we want to achieve and accomplish and all our goals and where we want to be and forget about appreciating where we are now in order to be in the right mindset to be able to achieve 
right. all the things that we want to achieve. And you brought up an interesting point about attachment, which is the original thing that we wanted to talk about. So could you speak a little bit about non-attachment, which is one of the uh, core philosophies of yoga? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think it's our human nature to have attachments. And to a certain extent, I don't see a problem with that necessarily. I think it's very natural mm -hmm. to have attachments. We want things to be a certain way. We have preferences. You know, we like things just so. <laughs> mm -hmm. It sort of makes up our personalities in a way. Mm -hmm. And what I like to try and focus on is that when my attachments start to cause suffering, when my preference isn't able to be met, how do I experience that? Like, what does that bring up for me? So if my attachment is really causing a lot of struggle for myself, then that would be an opportunity to let go mm -hmm. and practice non-attachment. Mm -hmm. For me, it's being open to things, playing out um, as they do. It's almost like just acknowledging reality for what it is mm -hmm. rather than holding on to an expectation of what I think it should be. Mm -hmm. It's like, one of my teachers once said this, like, who am I to challenge the entire universe? What should and shouldn't be? Right. So if I'm so attached to a certain outcome, and that's just not the way that it is. The reality is different than uh, the idea I had in my mind. How do I experience that? Am I able to? How do I accept that? Yeah. How do you accept that? <laughs> Well, <clears throat> people handle it differently. I see people that have a hard time with change, even simple changes where just the daily plan doesn't go accordingly and it can throw them off and they get tense and a little bit defensive and like upset about things. Um, I've generally flowed with change fairly easily. Um, I personally just find sort of a an allowance of things to shift and I can a adjust, and kind of change course pretty easily if something is not going the way I originally thought it would be. And so for myself, how do I allow it to happen, I guess? It feels like it's somewhat part of my nature or my personality. Do you think that's your personality or is it something that you've had in your awareness, maybe even from your mother and just being aware that it is an option to be open to things to happen and not try to make them something specific? I think it's probably both. Um, somewhat who I am and so it comes naturally to me but also I think it's a skill or it just a rather not a skill but a mindset mm -hmm. that anyone could focus on that anyone could practice if they had awareness of the moment when something isn't going as expectedly or according to plan and how they initially respond, if they are aware in that moment, they could then choose to consciously relax their body mm. rather than feel tense. Mm -hmm. mm. They could choose to focus on like taking several deep breaths. So it's more of like my internal experience I've seen in others, a tenseness, a, a sort of, 
uneasiness to when change is happening and then the communication gets you know affected by all of that they're more reactionary versus when i am allowing things to just be as they are i can then reroute very fluidly mm -hmm. it's like if i'm still stuck in my head about it shouldn't be this way then i'm in fantasy i'm in my mind i'm wishing it was differently than the way that it actually is if i acknowledge reality for what it is if i just okay now it's like this then i am i'm in reality i've acknowledged it for what it is and then i'm in a working plane mm -hmm. i can i can affect reality i can make changes to it if that reality isn't working for me but i see it for what it is then i have a starting point a place to move forward from it's not like oh i just go with the flow and if somebody's hurting me i'm just going to let them hurt me it's not about non action mm -hmm. it's about starting from reality if i'm in my mind saying they shouldn't be hurting me this shouldn't be happening to me why are they doing this to me i can't that's not like a a place where i can do anything mm -hmm. but if i if i'm like oh this this is happening this person is hurting me this does not work for me i'm going to remove myself from this situation i'm going to do whatever i can to make a change yeah so there's this difference of acceptance non-attachment allowing things to be i like to just remind myself that it's not a non-action it's just a starting point of seeing things as they are mm -hmm. and it also is very empowering i think because when you think when you're kind of busy and stuck in this blaming then you're putting the power on something that's outside of yourself but when you realize that okay this is the situation it empowers you in it really gives you like more energy it fills you up with energy in order to be able to um respond in a way that either taking yourself out of the situation or even communicating that it's not working for you definitely mm -hmm. yeah like i said it's like a working state it's a place where you can move forward based on what's actually happening yeah yeah you shared with me that you had a very profound experience uh with non-attachment in yeah. the last year would you mind sharing yeah yeah i was talking to a group of students recently about um about non-attachment about how it's natural for us to be attached to family members to loved ones right to you know the people closest to us it's one thing to say oh yeah i practice non-attachment but when someone really dear to you is no longer in their physical body it's like oh you really feel mm -hmm. the attachment that you had and I I kind of see two sides of it. So my father passed away and I miss I miss being able to hold him. So there's a a part of me that feels a grief or like a longing and at the same time i feel so much expansion and love in my heart when i remember that he is in everything and <clears throat> that i can connect with him any moment and I 
often find myself looking up at the sky. He was a, a pilot, and he loved to fly. So I see him in the birds, and so I feel a part of myself that's attached to the way it was in his body as my father, and then what helps me soften some of the intensity of that like longing for how it was is to remember that nothing ever really dies. Energy doesn't just disappear, but it transforms. And the, the idea that we're all connected is something that my mom has just shared with me my entire life growing up. She would say things like, you're God, I'm God. That tree out there is God. All of this is God. That glass is God. Like whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something I'm really thankful for because I, I get like a bit of relief from some of the sadness when I remember that and that feeling of connection is basically what makes it all okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow, that's really beautiful. And I think it's so meaningful in the way that if we truly want to embody and lean into this feeling of connectedness and also non-attachment so not being attached to how things maybe form physically um, remembering that it's all part of a whole that even if something isn't something that we can currently see or, or feel doesn't mean that it's not there and that we can't connect to it in a different way yeah so how how do you i mean you mentioned the sky and the birds and do you have a practice of kind of connecting to him maybe speaking to him maybe even asking for advice mostly being in nature is what reminds me and gives me that feeling of like just expansion and connection in my whole body. Um, sometimes I'll remember things that we did together and the other day I drove with my brother and our children, so my son and his two boys Uh, we took a road trip to the hot springs here in the mountains, and my brother ha inherited my father's truck, our father's truck, and we were driving back in the big diesel truck with mm. all the kids in the back, and I just felt like he was with us. Mm. I just thought, ah, oh, Dad would love this. Mm. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Yeah. It was the type of thing he always did with us. Like he would take us into nature all the time and we would explore and have a lot of adventures and fun together. So he's kind of is there with you, you know? Yeah. In the in the tradition that he instilled in you and the family that he created and all that he taught you you know to appreciate nature to to go out there and yeah. spend the time with you so in a way he's there with you um i heard somebody speak about this yesterday that he 
is with you with in the way that in everything that he gave to you and all the lessons that he taught to you and um yeah. in in that way he is still in your life as well yeah i feel really thankful for everything he shared with all of us all of his children he was super passionate about life he really like played hard he had a super <laughs> good time amazing yeah. mm -hmm. what is one of the biggest lessons you received from him to enjoy life mm. yeah that's amazing yeah to really like prioritize and make daily time for things that make your whole body say yes mm. Mm, that's beautiful yeah and it reminds me of what you what we were talking about before that really the way that we know how to move forward in life is through that joy right it's not about doing what we're supposed to do what like we think society is telling us to do but really following that joy is the way that we can tune into that flow the the river as your mother says <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's kind of how we all ended up here you know <laughs> mm. we would ask ourselves once in a while after arriving in Baja and staying way longer than planned we would just check <laughs> in and be like can you think of any reason to leave yet <laughs> no <laughs> okay let's continue to stay like it just oh. was flowing wow amazing yeah that you're so lucky that you all moved here together yeah i'm not sure if i would have stayed as long otherwise I'm really really connected with my family and feel so thankful we're all here together mm -hmm. you have an amazing family three of them have already been on the podcast nice. <laughs> full of wisdom and and love and so much to give and share it's incredible let's move to the closing curiosity questions that i end each episode with okay um the first one is what is something you've changed your mind about hmm. i've changed my mind about how i think other people should act and i've made room to just love them for who they are anyways hmm. I love that and it brings up for me that's beautiful to love what someone the way that they are and then I also say sometimes the way that someone is creates something in me that doesn't feel so good so how do you how do you deal with that I would love them from afar <laughs> so allowing them to be themselves and just loving them anyways doesn't mean that they're perfect or doing the right thing um, and it might mean that I need to take space from that person and that's okay <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah beautiful what is something that you didn't think you could do and you did Hmm. Well, I never thought I would be able to speak and sing comfortably in front of groups of people. Mm -hmm. And I do that pretty regularly now. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. I've loved your singing voice. Thank you. <laughs> Haven't been to your class yet, but I will be soon. <laughs> What gives you hope? seeing seeing children immersed in nature and exploring like the natural world really gives me a lot of hope and last question what are you curious about right now this is sort of vague but i'm just curious about the future i guess i'm curious about I'm curious about a potential future partner that I maybe am like dreaming up for myself. Mm, beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So curious to see where that goes. Yeah. 
Saraswati, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for having me. Now, after this time to nurture your mind and your spirit, we invite you to take a moment to consider others. A kind wish might come to mind. Know that what we learn becomes more valuable when we apply it and share it with others. So share this episode on Instagram stories, tag Yandara and I, or share with a loved one so that more people can benefit from it. Our hope is that the search will lead you home to who you already are, to what was always there. We'll be back next week with more inspiration, honest conversation, and insight into the energetic world around us. Thank you for listening and watching.